On the night of March 31st, 2011, Kenya Monhe, a 19-year-old college student, went out drinking with a group of friends when she unexpectedly vanished during the course of the evening. She was notably intoxicated and left behind her phone, purse, and keys at the nightclub she attended. Kenya's boyfriend calls her family the next morning to let them know that Kenya failed to come home the prior evening. Kenya's friends are then contacted by Kenya's family to further discuss their night out and to return her belongings. Kenya's stepfather, Tony, files a missing persons report and detectives begin retracing Kenya's footsteps. So far, authorities know Kenya used a fake ID to get inside a popular nightclub in the downtown Denver area. When reviewing surveillance footage from the club and surrounding businesses and apartment complexes, detectives are unable to find any further leads as to Kenya's disappearance. Although the 19-year-old appears on CCTV footage multiple times throughout the course of the evening, there is zero indication that she is in distress or in any imminent danger. With the investigation hitting a dead end, Tony receives Kenya's belongings back and begins his own private detective work. When searching through Kenya's phone for any clues, Tony finds a text from a man named Travis Forbes asking if she got home all right. This is Kenya's last known point of contact before she went missing in the early morning hours of April 1st. Tony contacts Travis and the two meet at a gas station to discuss his relation to Kenya. Travis claims he gave Kenya a ride home after seeing her alone, wandering aimlessly downtown. He remembers picking her up at around 2 a.m. after he spotted Kenya talking to a homeless man. On the route from downtown to her house, Kenya requested to stop at a nearby gas station to get some cigarettes. This is where Travis's involvement allegedly ends, as he claims Kenya left with the mystery man at the gas station who had cigarettes in his possession. Travis then leaves the gas station and drives away home. On April 5th, 2011, Denver police interview Travis and are suspicious of where his involvement ends. She was drunk and very emotional. And she was looking for somebody to, you know, comfort her. Yes, to comfort her. She asked him for a cigarette. And they walked off. And that's it. That was the last, that was it. And I went home. Do you ever have any contact with her? No. Travis worked out of a shared bakery in Denver, Colorado, where he made organic granola bars, and an unusual act in Travis's routine caught the attention of the bakery owner, who ended up contacting and submitting CCTV footage over to detectives. It showed Travis wearing large, yellow rubber gloves and rolling in an unusually large, tape-sealed white cooler into the bakery's freezer. Now, granola bars are not meant to be frozen or stored in a freezer, so the act seemed out of routine to the investigators reviewing the footage. Travis then purposely shuts down the security cameras in the bakery to conceal whatever tasks he performed next. Detectives were suspicious of Travis's story to begin with, and they now have visual confirmation further implicating the young entrepreneur. However, with no physical evidence such as DNA tying him to Kenya's disappearance or murder, detectives are unable to press any formal charges against Travis. Following his initial interview, Travis agreed to come back for a follow-up polygraph test, but never showed up. It seemed as though the case was going to go cold for quite some time unless a confession was divulged or breakthrough evidence was discovered, and as fate would have it, Travis Forbes was taken into custody by Fort Collins investigators on a charge completely unrelated to Kenya's disappearance. Travis caused another victim named Lydia Tillman to slip into a coma for five months after he assaulted, strangled, and doused her in bleach. The 31-year-old wanted to come clean about Lydia's assault and his previous homicide of Kenya Monge. In exchange for his confession, Travis requested to carry out his prison sentence without being labeled a sex offender. And along with pleading guilty to Kenya's murder, Travis agreed to show investigators where he buried her remains. Well, everything is true about what I told you, except for dro dro obviously dropping her off. And she started hitting me. I started hitting her back. When you say by hitting, were you punching her? Five months after the crime, Travis Forbes admits he killed Kenya Monhe. And then she started to scream. And I strangled her, strangled her, I strangled her. And I killed her. Travis took investigators to the exact spot where he buried Kenya. She was found in a shallow grave in Weld County under a cottonwood tree about 40 miles from Denver, Colorado. He stepped out of the truck and he let out this like wail, this just blood curdling wail. I thought, this is where she is. Right there. Right there. Back at the Fort Collins Police Department, Travis said he found Kenya intoxicated after she strayed from her friends, wandering around the downtown area and picked her up. 
While in his van, according to Travis, she passed out and he took advantage of her being drunk. Travis confessed to having sex with an unconscious Kenya in the backseat of his vehicle after falsely claiming he would take her back to her friends. Travis continues by saying that Kenya regained consciousness shortly after he sexually assaulted her. And according to Travis, Kenya started hitting him. Travis began hitting her back. Kenya then started screaming and Travis strangles the 19-year-old to death. Travis then drove around the entire day with Kenya's body in the back of his van, hiding her inside the big white cooler he later wheeled into the bakery's freezer, as seen on CCTV footage. He then goes on to burn everything that Kenya touched, including her clothing and the van's carpet, and drives her naked body to her shallow grave. Travis Forbes is found guilty of first-degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Kenya Monge. Without Travis's second crime and the bakery owner submitting the surveillance footage, Kenya's family would have never received the justice she deserved.